At Perspecta, we question, we seek, we solve. Our purpose is simple. We strengthen our nation and improve the lives of its citizens. We solve the most demanding national security and information-related challenges. Our rallying cry is mission success. Because what matters to our... Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Suzanne wilson Heckenberg, President of the Intelligence and National Security Alliance. Welcome back. Before we begin, I want to encourage you to join fellow attendees for the virtual happy hour today that starts at 5 p.m. sharp Eastern Time immediately after our series of Ignite Round presentations. Although we are meeting virtually for most of the summit, the happy hour is a terrific opportunity to connect with other attendees face-to-face -face while having some fun in the process. The happy hour is supported by INSA's Intelligence Champions Council and AFCEA's Emerging Professionals and Intelligence Committee, which both foster networking and professional development for the next generation of intelligence professionals. INSA and HFCIA have long worked to promote collaboration among technology innovators in government and industry. In our night round talks today, science and technology leaders from the public and private sectors will share their insights regarding innovation in the IC. To kick off our Ignite rounds, please join me in welcoming Damian DePippa, Intelligence Group Senior Vice President and General Manager at Perspecta who will introduce our first presenter. Thank you, Suzanne, and welcome to all of you who have joined us today. Although we are not able to be together in person, I applaud AFCIA and INSA for their responsiveness to the current pandemic and providing this virtual forum for us to come together. Perspecta has been a proud sponsor of INSA and AFCIA for many years and is honored to be sponsoring today's plenary session on technology and national security. When we look ahead to the future of the IC, Technology is not only an enabler, it is a force multiplier, allowing us to scale our intelligence operations in value without having to proportionally scale our people. But to do so, we must continually think outside the box. This is why innovation is at the core of everything we do at Perspecta. We are constantly pushing ourselves to look ahead to the changing landscape and develop new and innovative ways to serve our IC customers. It is a privilege to be associated with so many talented and dedicated professionals who are fostering innovation throughout the IC. Among them are the speakers for today's Ignite Rounds. The first of which is Don Myricks, the Deputy Director for Science and Technology at the CIA. Throughout her career, Don has held leadership positions in the field of innovation and technology across both government and industry. She explored and delivered complex technologies underpinning our national missions. Please join me in welcoming Don Myricks. Thank you, AFCIA and INSA, for giving me a platform to talk to your membership, and thank you, members, for being part of the national security team for, in many cases, a very long time. I've had the privilege of working with you many times in my career, and I'm really appreciative of this team and this group and this opportunity. I know it seems redundant to say that we live in unprecedented times. Statement of the obvious but I think we need to start there. But I think we need to start there from a, point, a, a viewpoint of power and how America responds to situations like this. The environment that we have created as a people and as a country has led to unprecedented breakthroughs in terms of the quality of living, in terms of people's ability to achieve for themselves and their families, but also in terms of what a community can accomplish with common purpose, common ideals, and common goals. And I think it's really important, particularly at this time, for us to remember that history and that that what is what defines us as Americans. To take on the hard, to get past parochial differences, to come together, and do things the world has never seen before. And frankly, team, I think this is one of those times. We've driven unprecedented changes for the better in governance, in economics, 
in education and in technology. And since that's my expertise, and I'm with a bunch of technical patriots today, I'd like to talk to you as a technical patriot to a technical patriot. If you think about the rate of change that we see in business and technology in particular, it's unprecedented as well. It used to be that there were flattened desk curves that reached global markets over, in some cases, decades. If you think about the adoption of radio, if you think about the adoption of fax machines, as technologists, great vision, long time to capitalize, long time to get to a global market. We went from flattened desk curves to basically cliff faces that get climbed in months. And then the next one comes along 18 months later. That's the opportunity. And shame on us if we don't leverage that for national security purposes because we are capable of that. In fact, we have fueled innumerable cases of that technology innovation and created markets that are now valued in billions and trillions of dollars. That's our opportunity. But let's talk about some facts that should at least be taken into consideration and that are sobering. The Chinese, as of 2019, according to the NSF, are out investing us in real dollars in R&D. Entrepreneurial funding is shifting from largely US-based to external to the US. That crossover hasn't occurred yet, but that's the trend. Forbes says that of, as of 2016, Chinese had eight times the number of STEM graduates as the United States. And based on the way entrepreneurship is rewarded in commercial markets, not tied to the USG, 52% of advanced R&D funding comes from industry, and 82% of development funding comes from industry, not the government. So I'm fond of saying insanity is defined as doing the same things over and over again, hoping for a different outcome. We need to change the facts on the ground as a community. So let me talk about what we're doing because I'm not going to ask you to do something that we won't do. And you've heard me give some of you this talk in a different form a number of times. IARPA is our BAA arm to work with academia and try to bring things from lab to pre-production. Check it out. Incutel is our VC arm that tries to take the best of commercial investment in early stages and bring it to production. Check Incutel out. But I want to also share with you two other things that we're doing because the missing ingredient in all of this has been taking care of our entrepreneurs that serve this community and serve in government. We have focused on reinforcing the service aspects for those entrepreneurs. And for many people, I'm a great example, many of you, I've known you for a long time, great examples as well. That service component completely supersedes the financial component. So two of the things that we've done that I'm pleased to announce are the launch of CIA Labs, which is our attempt, based on others before us, to actually register, in fact, patent the IPs of our inventors. We have already been granted two provisional patents in areas that would surprise nobody in this audience. But more than that, it creates relationship across the US academic community and academia, as well as the national labs of all flavors, so that we 
can talk about tough technical challenges, but by giving patents also provide financial reward over and above salary to our inventors. Because they, in fact, can accrue license revenue so that those good ideas actually return value not only to the individuals, but to the entities that register that information. So those patents that we've been granted will hopefully not only reward the inventors, but the folks that sponsored the patents. And yes, that would be us. That's a different way to think about taking care of our people. Because they all have the service gene, but boy, would I like them to at least be able to hang a patent on their wall. And I'd like yours to be able to do the same thing. The other thing that I'm pleased to discuss, encouraging diversity in STEM students across the country. It's time, folks. We've been talking about, and I've compared our own organization to, we are in class with other technology companies. And that class is a D. And we've all owned it. It's not just government. I can't tell you how many notes you and I have probably both seen from CEOs that talk about how they have not stepped into this diversity discussion the way they should. And we plan to leverage that like crazy because that raises the level of the water for everybody in the business of technology. And we hope, yes, we hope that we profit from that as well. Because it is a global economy and national security is inextricably tied to economic security and it helps everybody when we raise the level of the water in terms of global economic security. So we put our money where our mouth is. I know for those of you that have heard me give this talk in various forms before, um, I just wanted to communicate that we haven't rested on our laurels with InQtel and IARPA. And this problem that has been one for a long time in this community of not recognizing the entrepreneurs and the communities that sponsor those entrepreneurs is something that we need to address collectively. Because I think it matters, given the environment that I just described. So my question for all of you is, how do you recognize your entrepreneurs? Besides giving them more, more work, telling them what great national security contribution they're making, we try to tell stories too, that's important. The other thing that I'll point out is the government doesn't have to be the lead in this. I don't think this is a conversation about broken acquisition models. I think this is a conversation about courage, about leadership, and about vision and figuring out how we take care of our officers, of our employees, of our partners collectively in a way that the young and idealistic entrepreneurs or the old entrepreneurs like me don't have to make a choice that is so stark in terms of rewards. And I understand this is a hard conversation but I would submit to each of you that this community has been way too focused on return to shareholder. We give lip service to the fact that shareholders are US taxpayers, but I think we need to start acting like that's the case and that's the opportunity. This is our time. This is our responsibility. So we are hungry to have the conversations with you about what it is that we need to do as a community to take care of our entrepreneurs, but also this community, because this community matters immensely to national security. What we haven't done is th thought through how important our contribution could and would be to economic security. The fact that we have IP locked up that would change the conversation about 5G, think about MIMO. The fact that we have technology locked up that would change battery technology, AR, VR, AIML, 
computation, geospatial information representation, navigation, analytics, I could go on and on. It's an endless list of IP that we collectively own that the world desperately needs. And if your attitude is, I'll get this to production, it will save lives, and then I'll wait for the next procurement opportunity, then we are collectively part of the problem, not part of the solution. So we'd love to have that conversation with you because it matters. We have been called for such a time as this and we need to step into that, absolutely step into that. And the good news is I know many of you today. I've grown up with you. I've had the privilege to serve with you and we have done unbelievable things on behalf of our intelligence community, our warfighters and our taxpayers. We swear to serve and protect the same set of ideals as embodied in the Constitution. So with that, let me thank you for being part of this community and for, in many cases, dedicating your lives to this. I stand proudly and humbly and awestruck with the group of folks that are represented here today. Thank you for your service. Thank you for being committed to this set of ideals. And thank you for taking on this very important challenge at such a time as this. Thank you. Thank you, Don. That was terrific. We're so lucky to hear these strategic insights from a long-standing intelligence community, science and technology leader such as yourself. Next up, we have Dan Jablonski, the CEO of Maxar, one of the leading developers of geospatial technology for both national security and civil applications. Dan, over to you. Good afternoon, it's a pleasure to speak with you all today. I'd like to share my thoughts on how Earth intelligence technologies contribute to US national security and how commercial innovation will allow us to prepare for and operate in the conflicts that may lie ahead. The context for this discussion begins with the modern security environment, which is highly complex and volatile, as you all know. We're dealing with rapid technological changes. Our teams will have to respond to adversaries challenging us on faster timelines, and we will need to operate with shorter decision loops. On the one hand, rogue regimes are destabilizing their regions through the sponsorship of terrorism and the pursuit of nuclear capabilities and advanced weapons programs. Non-state actors continue to sow violent extremism, wage cyber warfare, and operate global drug and human trafficking networks. And climate change is accelerating diverse, wide-scale challenges that include more severe natural disasters, food shortages, population migrations, and conflicts over natural resources. On the other side of the continuum, this is all happening against a background where great power competitors, think Russia and China, increasingly wield hard and soft power in regions around the world to disrupt the balance of U.S. and allied security and economic influence. To protect U.S. and allied interests both at home and abroad, decision makers, intelligence analysts, and warfighters need to continue adapting and preparing, will need to keep pace with an extremely high velocity operational tempo, and will need more accurate, current, and detailed information about the entire world than ever before. At Maxar, we've spent more than 20 years and invested billions of dollars developing Earth intelligence capabilities that are tailored to meet evolving U.S. government and allied mission needs. As a trusted partner to the NRO, NGA, SOCOM, Army, Air Force, DARPA, and many of our closest allies in Europe, the Middle East, and Southeast Asia, this is core to who we are. Our 4,000 team members across the globe unlock the power of geospatial data to allow our mission partners to monitor, understand, and navigate our changing planet. We also, by the way, operate and build spacecraft that enable Earth observation, communications, and space exploration. Using the same assets that serve customers like Google, Uber, Apple, and Amazon, we collect and deliver the highest quality, most current imagery to more than 300,000 U.S. government users around the globe on platform-enabled devices, often within minutes of our satellites passing overhead. Over the last five years alone, we've invested more than $1 billion to enhance the world's most advanced commercial imaging constellation, upgrade and cloud enable a secure global network infrastructure, and create the software, tools, and platforms to deliver mission-ready data right out to the tactical edge at the velocity missions require. 
Beyond developing and building next generation Earth observation satellites, we're investing in artificial intelligence and machine learning tools that extract insights from incredible volumes of data and 3D technology to enable real-time data co-registration and synthetic training environments to prepare for the battlefield of the future. These are and have been important investments to advance U.S. technology and industrial capabilities. First, I'd like to share some recent examples of problems that can be solved with advanced geospatial information and capabilities. Many of these have to do with locations where aerial or ground access is denied, or areas that would be far too vast to understand, even with drones or resources on the ground. In one recent project, we focused on solving the following question. How do you quantify the generating capacity of newly developed energy infrastructure in a country that doesn't publish reports or statistics that could be relied upon? This type of analysis can contribute to the understanding of a nation's energy consumption and provide other insights into military production and political and economic stability. We started by applying our land cover change detection algorithms to the entire country's waterways to automatically identify riverbed changes that would be indicative of new hydroelectric power plants. Then Max, our satellite imagery was analyzed to confirm and characterize the plants. We also used crowdsourcing to discover and quantify rooftop solar panels in key urban centers, many of which could only be seen using our high resolution 30 centimeter imagery. Then we used multiple foundational data sets to generate predictive models to where future hydroelectric plants could be constructed and where solar panels could be placed in urban environments. And we did all of this with unclassified data with a small team in less than a month. In another case, we were asked to help understand the supply chain and production of methamphetamines in Afghanistan. The nation has been plagued by meth use since it was imported from Iran a decade ago, and the ephedra plant that grows high in the Afghan mountains is a key ingredient for its production. Our analysts used a digital elevation model to locate the ideal altitude ranges for ephedra growth in three Afghan provinces. They used sophisticated remote sensing techniques to identify specific mountainsides with physical characteristics suggesting ephedra harvesting was likely, and then performed spectral analysis to find where ephedra had probably been harvested in the last year. We were also asked to identify any newly constructed meth labs in a particular district. And finally, we were able to quickly comb through temporal stacks of imagery, looking for new runoff ponds indicating meth production, and found 36 suspected new labs. We've also been working to solve questions closer to home, in America's traditional sphere of influence in the Western Hemisphere. As you're aware, China is increasingly acting outside its borders, especially with its Belt and Road initiatives. We were asked to help assess the environmental and social consequences of China's growing economic investments in Latin America and the Caribbean. Geospatial analysis conducted by Maxar teams found a positive correlation between the larger and more frequent fires in Brazil's Amazon basin and environmental policies that have been relaxed to meet Chinese demand for agricultural products and oil. And in Bolivia, our satellite imagery and human landscape data sets revealed how Chinese-backed energy projects have encroached on national parkland and the lands of indigenous people. As we think about future conflicts through the lens of great power competition, the national security community will be challenged to understand an adversary that operates with far greater scale, speed, and organization with technologies and capabilities that may match or even exceed our own. An entire generation of intelligence analysts and warfighters came of age when our most pressing national security missions took place in asymmetrical environments, where we controlled the skies, space relays, communications channels, and nighttime environments. That won't be the case on the battlefields we need to prepare for now. One way that we can gain further advantage is to deploy more persistent, resilient, and cost-effective space-based sensors. At Maxar, we've been working to gain those advantages with our Next Generation Worldview Legion program. For many years, we've replaced older imaging satellites one for one with continually improving resolution, capacity, and agility. Next year, we will launch the initial six Worldview Legion satellites, which will triple our 30 centimeter imaging capacity and dramatically increase our revisit rate up to 15 times a day in the Middle East and Southeast Asia without sacrificing large area collection, resolution, or accuracy. The recent conflict on the Indo-Chinese border illustrates the benefits of this improved capability. In this geopolitical flashpoint, 20 Indian soldiers were killed, fighting with Chinese counterparts using low-tech batons and clubs at extremely high altitude terrain. Our current satellite fleet has allowed us to monitor the clashes in the Galwan Valley and the recent buildup of forces in the region, 
as well as at air bases in Western China on a daily basis, with enough detail to quantify and characterize the specific military vehicles present. Worldview Legion will deliver the same image quality with far greater persistence, giving us the ability to collect multiple times per day at these locations. The growing number of sensors and exploding volume of data are certainly a boon for national security, but analysts must be able to synthesize these massive amounts of data and hone in on the most valuable pieces of information in time to affect the mission, whether that data is imagery, radar, electronic emissions, or cyber information. These are big data systems integration and velocity problems. Maxar is deeply familiar with this challenge as our satellites collect 75 terabytes of new content each day. It would take a single analyst 80 years to manually extract just a single feature type from this volume. So we understand that AI and ML technologies are a force multiplier for imagery analysts, and they are in fact the only way to understand change with the necessary speed and scale. Maxar has built a global feature extraction platform that can find and map hundreds of thousands of kilometers of roads and railways in minutes by using change detection and predictive analytics to create a feedback loop that optimizes the use of our constellation. And we've been developing edge computing technologies that provide analyst augmentation at the desktop using local compute resources, allowing objects to be automatically detected and mapped as a user pans through imagery. For example, we started with buildings and cars, and now we're moving on to mobile field artillery and airplanes. In the next era, warfighters and intelligence analysts will be challenged to operate in an environment where some of their greatest advantages are disrupted by the enemy. Let me ask you, what capabilities are we most reliant on? If you were an adversary, would you seek to disrupt those capabilities to gain greater advantages? We've already seen some of these tactics employed. Before sending troops into the Crimea in 2014, Russia disrupted Ukraine's online banking system, ATM suddenly didn't work, and jammed global navigation satellite signals. GPS functionality suddenly froze up. We're moving into an era of increasingly sophisticated cyber and electronic warfare capabilities. How reliant are the US and its allies for satellite navigation? What happens to weapon systems, flight software, ground-based navigation, the ability to fly drones at long distances if GPS and other GNSS capabilities are denied? At Maxar, we've been working on solving this problem. We've been investing in technology to create highly accurate, immersive, real-world 3D environments derived from our satellite imagery. By using precision 3D registration to place multi-source sensor data, Maxar's near real-time geo-registration capabilities can be integrated into navigation solutions for very precise positioning data in GNSS-denied environments. We're working with partners to develop more resilient autonomous navigation systems that can operate in a GNSS denied environment using highly accurate optical recognition software and tools. Our partners are flying real trials on sophisticated fighter aircraft. 3D technology also has massive potential to enhance sensor fusion, training and simulation, and precision targeting. We can make low accuracy data sources like drone feeds more useful by geo-registering them against Maxar's precision 3D foundational layer and fusing them with other data sources to create a virtual experience that replicates vehicle and ground force engagements. We're now conducting advanced trials to register and lock down drone location data in real time. With the US Army's One World Terrain program, we're helping the Army achieve its vision of building an authoritative, high resolution, 3D digital twin of the planet in order to simulate battlefield environments to support interactive mission training and rehearsal anywhere in the world. This will permit multi-echelon rehearsals and simulations for everyone, from the helicopter pilots to the battalion staff to the fire teams tasked with taking objectives. Over time, Maxar's digital twin of the physical Earth will provide foundation data to augment the experience of operators for, for maneuver and fire missions. A real 3D constantly updating digital globe and by combining precision 3D registration technology with Maxar's industry-leading satellite imaging constellation, remote ground terminal capabilities to connect soldiers in remote locations and AI-enabled automated object detection, we can help military leaders confidently execute long-range precision fires by minimizing the timeline between target verification and action. The machine-ready nature of 3D data is a key enabler for automation, both for sensor fusion and target mensuration and is essential to driving targeting timelines down, minimizing collateral damage and increasing lethality against intended targets. 
Maxar's 3D technology offers more than twice the accuracy of targeting requirements at a global scale. Spherical accuracy within three meters along X, Y, and Z axes. And we're headed to one meter spherical accuracy in our R&D trials. I hope that I've provided a few interesting examples of the many things we're working on, the ways we'll need to work together to prevail against adversaries, and the value that geospatial information and 3D technology has for warfighters and decision makers' ability to understand, decide, and act to protect our national interests. Thank you for the opportunity to share a few thoughts today. Maxar is proud to partner with the U.S. national security community and is investing in innovative technologies that address pressing challenges of today while moving quickly to prepare for the critical requirements to operate in the conflicts that lie ahead. Thank you, Dan. It's always fascinating to hear views from C-suite leaders such as yourself. Next, we will hear from another private sector technology leader, Robert Shelton, Chief Technology Officer of Microsoft's Federal National Security Group, which provides a range of offerings to federal government agencies. Robert, over to you. Thank you for allowing me to speak with you today. The, uh, the topic that I'd like to talk about is um, uh, a potential uh, strategy for the government to see uh, greater innovation in how software and technology is delivered. Um, the thing I want to talk about is uh, how the government can use the model that is generally known as software as a service in order to uh, increase the, the adoption of software while reducing the amount of time and cost it takes to build that software. And so before I get into sort of the government or the intelligence community aspect of it, I want to put it in terms that I think we can all understand. So today, um, whether you have an iPhone or an Android phone, um, or even a PC, you go in, if you want an application to, to do something, let's say you wanted to, um, to do your, your tax returns. Today, you would go into uh, most likely uh, an app store sort of scenario, and you would download that application. Um, most commonly, uh, the, the one that comes to my mind is TurboTax. Now, the interesting thing is, is that TurboTax by itself, if you just used it, um, it's a great piece of software, but you, you're forced to fill in a bunch of information and the more complex your, your tax return is, the more information you're gonna have to fill out. Um, however, if, you, if your bank also offers an online app, like mine does, then one of the interesting things is that TurboTax has uh, connectors or using open API to connect the uh, uh, the banking system to to the tax application. And if you have your 401k is with any of the most common um, uh, companies that handle 401ks and, and other investments, um, TurboTax actually has connectors to most of those as well. But, but in reality, you have three different apps that you went out and got. Uh, one was built by your bank and they do really good at banking things. And that's, you know, they may venture out of that a little bit, but for the most part, they're focused on the banking thing. And then the investment companies are generally focused on the investments and, you know, stocks and 401ks and so forth. And again, the tax application is focused on the tax, tax app the component of this. And they all work together because of an open API and open data standards, agreements that are made by those companies. I think um, that the government can create an environment where that could happen at all networks. Unclass commercially already works, that exists today. Um, but I think they can get that at all levels of the network um, uh, if the government chooses to um, require just open APIs and open data standards. Um, this would make, mean a major change in how acquisition is made today. Um, if, I, if the government wants a solution there's generally a long requirements gathering process, and then there's a acquisition process, and the acquisition process costs the, the winners and the losers a great deal of money, which is then baked into the, um, to the price of the application. And then there's generally some long delivery time period. And by the time that has all happened, the original requirements, the user who made those requirements, um, may no longer be interested in that system or other events may have over, overtaken the requirements. And so then you end up with a situation of, by the time I got the thing that I asked for, I already need changes and then the changes require additional uh, costs and time and it becomes this, this huge mess. Um, 
in a in a commercial world, that's generally not the same any longer. Um, you buy the individual components built by people who specialize in those things, and then those those systems can be assembled together. Uh, often you can try them before you actually buy them. Now again, in the government space, I'm not exactly sure um, how try before you buy would work, but you know I think it would be an interesting thing to allow an end user some degree of of trying, um, even if it's a limited amount of usage, before they they buy. Um, and then the funny thing about that is if you have a, the amplification um, uh, approach or um, building apps for the, in the government space, um, one of the interesting things is that you'll find the quality of those apps go up. And the reason is, is that generally in these app markets, uh, marketplaces, you have the ability to um, give it stars or 1 through 10 ratings. And the ones who have the best ratings generally get the most downloads, and the vendors who make those applications generally make the most money. Um, and it could be a quality versus price thing, but the, the, the end users generally will vote on the applications that they, they think are the best, which will then drive uh, the developers and the companies who make competitive solutions to improve their products or reduce the price, whichever the combination needs to be, in order to get better feedback. Now again, major change in acquisitions would have to have to happen, and then also there would have to be some requirements levied on open API and open standards. Now I have a lot of hope that the government can do this because if you'd have told me five or six years ago that the intelligence community was going to adopt cloud computing, I would have struggled like most people to believe that that was going to happen. But the intelligence community uh, not only did it, but they kind of led the way. So. I, I think that this has a possibility of happening as well. You know, my company, I work for Microsoft. Um, there's this thing called Microsoft 365 um, or its predecessor Office 365, which is another example of the, the uh, software as a service approach. If you think about it, uh, Microsoft 365 or Office 365 is a combination of a variety of apps that work together. Excel does spreadsheets really well, but it's not a word process. Word is a word processor, but it's not a spreadsheet tool. PowerPoint is a presentation tool. It's not a word processor or a spreadsheet tool. And then you have Microsoft Access and so forth and so on. But each one of those applications work together in a very interesting way. If I want to build a spreadsheet and I want to present on it later, I can build it in Excel um, and then import it or copy and paste it into PowerPoint, and it'll still be live, and I can use PowerPoint to build a story around a presentation. Now, because of how Microsoft built the software, and again, same scenario with the banking and tax format, because of how Microsoft built the, the application, other vendors, like one of the vendors that I use is Gram uh, Grammarly. And Grammarly is a grammar checking and it helps you improve the, the quality of your writing. Um, plugs into Outlook, it plugs into Word, plugs into all these things, right? And so as I'm typing in a Word document, in addition to spell checking built in the word, I get these this other feedback from this other system that is plugged in. It's a very interesting thing. Um, if I if I don't like Grammarly, I can stop using it and stop paying for it, right? And I, there may be a competitor. As a matter of fact, Microsoft has a, a tool now that does some similar sorts of things that I'm I'm trying right now because if it works out really well for me, then I can stop paying for Grammarly. Microsoft doesn't pay pay for Grammarly for me. This is coming out of my own personal pocket. And so, again, you see a change in behavior. I used it. I like it. Um, I am constantly looking for a better, less expensive sort of scenario. And then if I find one that I like, I will then start, I will download it, use it. If it, if it works well, I may switch to it. I think the government will find its way to a similar sort of scenario. And then what will happen is the amount of time it takes to um, to assemble, I don't want to see it build anymore, assemble software, the amount of time will reduce. Um, interestingly enough, that's a win-win for both the government and the industry. See, the funny thing about, um, most people know this, I believe, um, is that the, the way that the, the contracting work, world works now, if, if the government wants a piece of software and, and three vendors bid on it, the two losing vendors had to spend a lot of money to go after that piece of work. And then the winning vendor, who also spent a lot of money, 
trying to capture that piece of work, has to then build the cost of that acquisition, the, the, the time it took the people to write and do all the work over many months, sometimes years, all that's baked into the cost of the software. And so it costs the government more. In this scenario, I get to build solutions or components based off of my expertise and my understanding of that industry and then make them available for users to try and then buy. And the better I am, the smarter I am about that particular requirement, the more adoption I get, and therefore the more money I make. Without all the cost of going after a long acquisition. So I think the government may end up in this direction. Another interesting benefit is if instead of building end-to-end -end solutions, which in the IC often are classified, if I'm building individual components, some of those components can actually be built cheaply in the unclass environment. Or in some cases, even they may already exist, and I can just go and buy them and then move them up and enter into a relationship with the vendor who creates them, um, and then use those components together to build a solution. So again, I think that um, the next step in ev evolution around uh, software acquisition and um, and, and the improvement of, of uh, capabilities in the intelligence community will be this push towards software as a service. Again, it's going to take some changes. It's going to take some work. There's got to be changes in acquisition rules. There's got to be requirements to, 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 um, to, to put in open standards and open APIs and enforce them. Um, and then you have all the security components that go along with that, which will become a little more interesting when you're not looking at a VM to see if it's leaking data or not, it's just a small app that does a thing. Um, but again, the intelligence community adopted cloud, um, so at mostly IaaS, so I am really confident that I think the intelligence community and the U.S. government will be able to effectively adopt software as a service. And not just for the things that you would think of today, the, the Office 365, the Salesforce.com type of things. I think that the next step will be to offer marketplace scenarios where I as a developer can build components that do a very specific thing that, I, that I'm an expert at and then sell it as a consumption-based or licensing-based out of the, out of the cloud the way that iTunes and the uh, Google Play Store kind of does today. So again, that's what I think is the next step. I want to thank you for your time today. And now over to you, Suzanne. Robert, thank you for those insights. Our last speaker is Catherine Marsh, Director of the Intelligence Advanced Research Projects Activity, or IARPA. IARPA invests in high-risk, high-payoff research programs to tackle the intelligence community's most difficult challenges. It works across the intelligence community with the private sector to apply the results of this research to intelligence operations. A longtime member of CIA's Science and Technology Directorate with extensive experience in industry, Catherine became director of IARPA in November of 2019. Catherine, over to you. Good afternoon. Thank you for inviting us to share our insights into where emerging trends in technology are driving our research and technology programs. In the IC, we strive to create intelligence advantage through the effective use of technology. With our deep understanding of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, we're capable of developing, applying, deploying, and understanding the impacts and risk of technology anywhere on the globe. But let's face it, Technology is everywhere, representing both opportunities and threats. Further, technical innovation takes place everywhere across all segments of the economy and human behaviors, both the good and the bad. Thus, the event frontier is much, much larger than in decades past. Couple this with the fact that the degree and complexity and the speed of change make problem set too much for any individual or organization to comprehend and process. This is why we need to partner and team effectively if we're going to be successful. But make no mistake, as technology becomes ubiquitous and changes rapidly, it becomes easier to deploy and even easier to use in operations, both by us and against us, by our adversaries. 
while offensive and defensive use of technology is not exactly new. The pace of change and the diversity of options make it an imperative that we adapt and evolve just as rapidly. In the intelligence business, we have the requirements to push the edge of the envelope, to drive the state of the art of technology, to solve hard problems, putting together seemingly unrelated pieces, a jigsaw puzzle, if you will, to ensure technical excellence for our nation and deliver exquisite capabilities that perhaps we will use only once and move on. As scientists and engineers, our challenge, in fact, is to provide an unfair technical advantage over our adversaries. But we cannot do this alone. We must forge strong partnerships, not only with industry, but with academia, where new cutting edge research and development have the opportunity to fundamentally change the capabilities we deliver to our nation. At IARPA, the Intelligence Advanced Research Projects Activity, modeled after DARPA, we invest in high risk, high payoff research on behalf of the entire intelligence community. Positioned within the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, who leads and supports the integration of the IC, delivering insights, driving capabilities, and investing in the future to enable decisive national security advantage. IARPA's real value is our research programs. These are three to five years in duration, intensely focused on the program goal, and are highly structured to create, to ensure that progress is achieved. They aim to create capability where none exists today. That is what IARP promises the IC we will deliver. With our unique mission, talented workforce who bring creativity and deep technical expertise, and our partners across the community and country, we are well positioned to drive and build on our research programs and capabilities to help address the IC's greatest challenges moving forward. Some of the key opportunities for you in the very near future is through the really exciting new research programs that we are putting out for solicitations. We do, to the maximum extent possible, full and open competition through the broad agency announcement process. We have an open seedling BAA soliciting proposals, developing technology solutions from, for some of the national security challenges imposed by COVID-19. Many proposals have come in and we anticipate awarding multiple applicants. We also have three new programs that are about to go live on sam.beta.gov and they represent the next generation of IARPA programs. You can find out in much more detail on the IARPA website at iarpa.gov. But for an early sample, resilience, robust energy storage, for intelligence logistics in extreme novel and challenging environments, seeks to develop reliable power sources to meet IC needs for high energy density, high power density, long calendar life, quiet operation, and robustness in extreme environmental conditions. Scissors, securing compartmented information with smart radio systems, seeks to develop smart radio techniques to automatically detect and characterize RF anomalies in complex RF environments. The specific types of anomalies include low probability of intercept signals, altered or mimic signals, and abnormal unintended emissions. Briar, biometric recognition and identification at altitude and range, claims to develop software algorithms based systems capable of performing whole body biometric identification at long range and from elevated platforms. But we won't stop there. I am confident that there will be a number of additional new programs this year. In fact, we've offered, already have three new start pitches since the beginning of summer. As you can see, we are busy at IARPA. So how have we been able to continue this mission during the COVID-19 pandemic? One of our major accomplishments during this time has been our seamless transition to the remote working environment in the cloud. Unlike most of the IC, the majority of our work is unclassified. And because we were prepared with an approved, secure, cloud-based virtual environment, we were able to pivot literally overnight to having our team work safely in isolation away from the office. We've coupled this with other secure collaboration tools such as Skype for Business and WebEx and continue to do all our program reviews meet with our performers and partners, 
all virtually. So what are some of the specific challenges facing IARPA and how would you say we're helping overcome those challenges? The ability to conduct intelligence mission is unique and presents very different challenges than what most people will ever face or even think about in their lives. The challenges that intelligence officers face are formidable, whether they're working at headquarters, analyzing the ever increasing volumes of data being generated today, or working overseas in a clandestine manner. To do this in our interconnected world presents a unique set of opportunities for IARPA. The opportunity to enhance how our IC partners conduct their mission is what drives the creativity and dedication of our program managers. To be honest, some of the most specific challenges are classified and we cannot discuss them in detail. The reason IARPA is able to work in an open, unclassified manner is our research and technology protection program. This is an IARPA best practice that provides guidance to our program managers, allowing them to manage teams of uncleared researchers to work in unclassified settings while developing solutions that might apply to highly classified missions. The definition of intelligence is providing advanced warning of possible events to come. This requires analytical techniques that can handle massive amounts of data and deliver reliable information to decision makers with enough warning that actions can be taken to protect the security of our nation and its people. The challenges we face in doing this are speed, volume, and reliability. Those challenges must be met regardless of the modality of the data. Speech and text in any language, imagery, video, chemical spectra, communication signals. Moreover, the analysts must link the data to possible outcomes. IARPA is applying leading edge artificial intelligence and machine learning techniques to make the problem tractable. On our collection front, ever more sensitive chemical detectors enable better fidelity and earlier warnings. New signals from IoT devices can be processed to learn intent. Remote sensors and cameras provide information never imagined before. Developing new sensors and detectors as, way, as well as clever ways to collect multimodal data to reveal what our adversaries are attempting to hide from us is at the very core of our collection programs. High performance computing sits at the interface between collection and analysis. We are developing novel methods such as DNA storage to be able to store and access the data we collect and we continue to invest in quantum computing and cryogenic computing to deliver processing speeds never before seen. We're also developing new methods to allow users to share data securely. The challenges that face the intelligence community are real and expansive. They span the gamut from mascara to satellites. When we took down Osama bin Laden on May 2nd, 2011, it was in fact the application of superb analytical, technical, and human tradecraft that enabled the success of that mission. Tradecraft that most people in the world will never have insight into. When you come into this profession, it isn't to be the big wig in the news or with a suite of publications. In fact, most of the biggest successes we have remain unsung to the rest of the world. But that is still not enough. What got us here will not get us there. We need the cutting edge research and exquisite development to get to that next level, to drive us to the next moonshot, to always improve what we deliver for this nation. We need you to think about the, think about the challenging problems the IC faces and how your capabilities can address these problems. How can we use AI to address the growing challenges of overwhelming volumes of data the IC needs to analyze? Yet be assured that our use of AI is safe and that the AI algorithms have not been spoofed to give us unreliable results or that AI has been used to create unreliable data. For example, GANs that can construct realistic images that depict, depict events that never happened. How do we protect data while stored in transit while undergoing processing? How can we use new materials to generate electricity, serve as sensors, or enable us to do computing faster. We need new thinking and new partners to challenge the status quo and imagine a different way of doing things, to realize new, even bigger capabilities 
this year and beyond, like they show on TV and we really wish we could do. I look forward to working with you to deliver technology that matters so together we can support our national security mission and serve this country. Thank you. Well, that was a terrific close to today's program. Thank you, Catherine, Dawn, Dan, and Robert. The ICC Epic Happy Hour begins in just a few minutes, so I will make this brief. First, we hope you will stick around for this happy hour, supported this evening by Dell. Attendees will break into small groups and compete for fun prizes while testing their knowledge of spy trivia. It promises to be a lot of fun. Also, please take time today or tomorrow to stop by our virtual kiosk and learn more about the innovative products and technologies that our exhibitors will be presenting. I would also like to thank our sponsors once again. We could not present this type of high level content without their support. And finally, we have an amazing lineup in store for you all tomorrow. I look forward to welcoming you back in the morning at 11 a.m. Eastern time when Washington Post columnist David Ignatius will be joining us for a panel of women serving as CEOs or division presidents at large government contractors. I hope everyone has a wonderful evening and I look forward to seeing you all back here tomorrow at 11 a.m.